Our reading for today is from Ruth 2. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the clan of Elimelech, a man of standing, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go into the fields and pick up leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they called back. Boaz asked the foreman of the harvesters, Whose young woman is that? The foreman replied, She is the Moabitess, who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She went into the field and has worked steadily from morning until now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with my servant girls. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow after the girls. I have told the men not to touch you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She exclaimed, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I have been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have given me comfort and have spoken kindly to your servant. Though I do not have the standing of one of your servant girls. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come over here, have some bread, dip it in the wine vinegar. And when she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men Even if she gathers among the sheaves, don't embarrass her. Rather, pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up. Don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until the evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered, and it amounted to about an epath. She carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. Her mother-in-law asked her, Where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the men who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. The Lord has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our kinsmen redeemers. Then Ruth the Moabitess said, he even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with his girls, because in someone else's field, you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the servant girls of Boaz to glean until the barley and the wheat harvests were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. The word of the Lord. Children are dismissed if they would like to head out to Children's Church at this time. My mom really hates when she listens to the sermons online later and I tell a story about her. So now I'm going to tell a story about her. I, she was on the phone with me yesterday and she said, You told them that I hit you. And I said, no, I, I told him I cussed you and you corrected me. Pay attention. Different story this time, though. 
My, my mom, when we were little kids, I, got a, I, got a younger, I have a younger brother who's, when we were very little, much younger, uh, my mom hates vegetables. Like, she just does. She acts like they have arsenic in them and they will kill her if they go into her body. So she couldn't, like, model. You know, with little kids, ah, mommy will eat a carrot and you eat a carrot. And since she couldn't model it because she thinks they're going to poison her, she did the second best thing. She lied, right? So she would just say things like, if you eat your carrots, you will see in the dark. Now, I have eaten a lot of carrots in my lifetime. I can't even see in the sunlight without glasses. She lied, okay? But she would tell my little brother, and I like this story because he's now this big, but when he was this little, she would say to him, if you eat your green beans, you'll get hair on your chest. <laughs> I don't understand why looking like a gorilla is a motivating factor, but it was for my little brother, and he was too. So he would sit at the table, he would take a bite of the green beans, and no joke, whether we were in public or not, he would lift his shirt, he would look, and then he would stare at my mother and say, no hair yet. And she'd say, yeah, I've got to eat more. <laughs> I was thinking about that this week, in part because it makes me laugh, but also because I think my little brother and his, nothing yet, I do the adult equivalent when I pray. You know what I mean? I close my eyes and I come before my God and I say, Lord, uh, there's relational emptiness right now between me and this person that we, we spoke in a way that we shouldn't have. We, we had a fight and I need you to fill that with your peace. And then I open my eyes and I go, oh, you didn't fix it. Or I'll close my eyes and I'll say, Lord, there is this emptiness uh, in my world right now. I, I need a uh, a person to be present. I'm, I'm lonely. Or God, I, I, I am in need of something financial to be provided or, or something physical. God, you've got to touch it. And I open my eyes and go, I did it. Where's the answer? You do this? I pray about things all the time. And the moment I open my eyes, I'm like my little brother going, I ate the green beans, where's the hair? And it got me thinking about it this week because we didn't, we didn't touch on it very much last week when we were in uh, Ruth chapter 1. But you know, Naomi prays a prayer in Ruth chapter 1. And it honestly is this prayer that, that we're watching unfold and be answered for four solid chapters for a chunk of her life. Right? We can read it in 10 minutes, but it was much longer than that for her. And what we watch is Naomi and Ruth having to decide, can they rest? Can they have peace while they wait for God to answer this prayer? The prayer that Naomi prayed was very straightforward. In, in its context, if you remember, this is the section in Ruth 1 where, where Ruth, Naomi excuse me, has lost everything. Lost everything, guys. Uh, she uh, and her husband uh, left the land of promise. They decided to put down roots in the land of compromise, and the choices they made, the sin that they chose, had consequences in their life. And so did the fact that they live in a broken, messed up world. And at this point, Naomi's husband and her two sons, and it sounds like it was like a tragic accident, it happened all at the same moment for the sons, she is empty. She's on her way back to Bethlehem, kind of begrudgingly, She's got her two daughters-in-law with her, uh, Ruth and Orpah, and she says to them, go back, <laughs> stay at home, don't, don't bother coming with me. And here's her prayer. She says, may the Lord show, uh, my NIV version says, kindness. Uh, that word in Hebrew is chesed, which is kind of fun, it's a good thing no one sits in the splash zone, right? Chesed is this incredibly important Hebrew word, guys. There is no one-to-one -one English equivalent. Like, you just can't. You got to do, like, a full-on preacher sentence, right? Because that word that we summarize here is as kindness, or some of your English translations will say loving kindness or loyal kindness. Um, in reality, what it means is this, this part, uh, this characteristic, this attribute about God, that he is a God who keeps his covenant, that he shows love, and faithfulness, and the steadfast commitment to his covenant promises when we don't, no matter how much it costs him. Right? That's what this means. It's this idea of a love that is costly. That whatever it costs God to keep the covenant, he will. 
So Naomi, who walked away from the covenant, still knows that God's the covenant-keeping God. And so she prays, may he, may Yahweh, show that that steadfast, covenant-keeping, sacrificial love to you as you have shown it to your dead, so meaning their, their husbands, and to me. And here's how she wants him to do it. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Right? That's her prayer. And when a couple verses later in chapter 1, Ruth makes these amazing vows to Naomi. Ruth says to Naomi, hey, listen, I'm not going back to Moab. I'm not worshiping my little G-gods anymore. Your God is my God. That covenant-keeping God, I'm in. It's almost like she is shouting, amen, to this prayer. Right? Ruth says to Naomi, I'm going to go with you where you go, I go, where you stay, I stay, where you die, I die, and I will be married because I'm serving this God. And they pray, Lord, here's what we're asking you to do. Fill the emptiness. And the specific way that Naomi's asking God to fill emptiness in Ruth's life, and we'll find out in her life too, is that Ruth would find rest in the home of a husband. Do you remember how chapter 1 ends? Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem at the, as the barley harvest was beginning. Chapter 1 finishes. They ate their green beans, and there is no hair, right? They pray the prayer, and what you end up with at the end of chapter 1 is two widows in a culture where what that would mean is they've got no protection, no provision, and no means for any of it. They open their eyes from the prayer, and it's like, God, what are you doing? We know, because we know the end of the story, that God is very much answering that prayer. That over the season that follows this season, it just feels like absolute emptiness. God is slowly, but surely, filling it with himself. And as I was praying about it this week, I figured that many of you, just like me, are in a season right now where some part of life feels empty. Where some part of life, we've been praying and praying and praying and we open our eyes and no hair. God hasn't answered it yet or we don't see it. And what I'd like us to see this morning as we're looking at Ruth chapter 2 is what we can begin to look for what we can look for in those seasons of waiting. I, I want us to think about how do you have peace while you're waiting? Because friends, some of us will be waiting like Ruth and Naomi for a season. Some of us will wait until glory. Let me rephrase that. For some things, all of us will wait until glory, until the emptiness is completely filled. In the meantime, how do we have peace while we're waiting? And I think what we're going to see as we look at Ruth 2 is, is you can fix your eyes on two things while you're waiting. God's fingerprints and God's faithfulness. So let's talk about the fingerprints. Chapter 2 opens, and we are told, uh, verse 1, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the clan of Elimelech, a man of standing whose name was Boaz. We are given Zippo context. But when uh, a Hebrew writer gives you a special detail that seems out of place, pay attention. Because they didn't waste words. So this is our author's way of saying, this is going to matter, right? Next thing we're told is that Ruth and Naomi, they're there in Bethlehem. Uh, the famine has ended in Bethlehem, but not in their worlds, right? The cupboards are bare. So Ruth wakes up that morning, looks at Naomi, and says, well, we've got to do something. She says, I'm going to go into the fields and I'm going to glean in any field where I uh, basically, it says, I find favor in someone's eyes. I, I'm going to do it in any field I don't get chased out of is basically what that boils down to. Now, gleaning. Here's, here's your little history lesson for a second. It, it, God's kingdom, whether we're talking now or we're talking back then, it has a principle. And the principle is pretty straightforward. If you have enough, you provide for those who don't. Right? That's a kingdom principle. Uh, God's kingdom is never, ever going to be, if you have enough, stockpile more. It will always be. If you've got enough, provide for those who don't. And in Ruth's day and age, uh, under the old covenant law, 
the rules for how you provided for those who didn't have enough was that if you owned a field, you were in charge of it, you could hire people to harvest your field, but they couldn't harvest all the way to the boundary lines. And whatever they dropped in the harvesting process, they can't go back and pick up. Because the stuff at the boundaries and whatever you dropped was for the poor, for the widows, for the orphans to come glean and have enough to subsist, okay? So Ruth wakes up, looks at Naomi, and says, it's harvest season, I'm going to come under God's promises, and I'm going to go try to find a, a, a worker out there, or a field owner out there, who honors God, and will let me get enough to be able to live off of. And here's the fun part, right? Naomi says, go for it, have a great old time. So, verse 3, she went out, and she began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters, as it turned out, the Hebrew says, as chance chanced, or we would say, as luck would have it, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. What a coincidence. And verse 4, just then, as chance chanced, as luck would have it, Boaz shows up. Now, pause here for a minute, friends. You get to hear what our narrator's doing. The, the narrator, the, the author of the book of Ruth, if you know the end of it, you, you know that he talks about two generations afterwards. So that means he's looking way back in time, right? He knows the end of the story. We're 60 years out, and he's looking back, and he goes, I know what happened, and I know how it ends up. But Ruth doesn't. Ruth woke up that morning. She prayed the prayer. And there was no food in the cupboard. Ruth woke up that morning, and she wanted to have a husband, and there were no prospects. Ruth woke up that morning, and everything was empty. So from her perspective, she got up. The logical thing is go glean, find a field. She randomly finds some field. As far as she's concerned, as chance chanced, I end up in this guy named Boaz's field. And she's got no idea what's going to happen in the next couple chapters because she's living in that moment, right? Where she sits, this is a fluke. But our narrator knows the whole story. So our narrator says, oh yeah, as chance chanced, because he knows this is no random coincidence. As a matter of fact, if he knows the Lord, he knows there's no such thing as a random coincidence. Our narrator's looking at this and going, God's fingerprints are all over it. Every single detail that Ruth woke up, that of all the fields she could go to, it's Boaz's, and that at the moment she's there, Boaz shows up. God's fingerprints are all over every detail, and they will stay all over every detail because there is nothing that happens in your life, in her life, in my life that is random and outside of the control of our God. Now, you and I know this intuitively. If you're older than, say, five, you can look back on your life, and you can look back at circumstances that when you were walking through them, it was, oh, yeah, it's chance, chance. That door opened. You know, I ended up here as your pastor because as chance, chance, I had breakfast with Frank Frischkorn one day. And in the moment, that's what it felt like. Yeah, we just had breakfast. It was some Monday. Nothing significant. Only the day before he'd been here and the day before he'd heard an announcement that six months prior to, I had wanted an answer to. As chance chanced. You can look back in your life further in and look back and say, I see it now. I see the fingerprints. I see that God closed that door, but he opened that one. I see that God brought that person in my life or took that one out. I see that in that season of emptiness, God was, was like a, a, a potter. He was molding and shaping and forming me because he knew what was coming. And in the moment, you could see none of it. And frankly, I think I'm going to get to glory and God's going to say, it's so cute, you think you could see all of it. Here's the thing, and then we're going to move along because this one's a fast point. If I can look back on my lifetime, just like this narrator can look back two generations and say, yeah, that was not chance, that's God's fingerprints. Then when I'm in this moment, 
And I prayed the prayer, and it just feels like it's still empty, Lord, and I'm waiting. I can have peace in this moment, even if I can't see his fingerprints, because I know his fingerprints have been on everything in my life. That means that he is in control in this moment. Do you hear me? Whatever you're going through, I don't care if you can't see any evidence of him. He's right there. That's the first way we get peace in the waiting. The second is God's faithfulness. So we do know the rest of the story, friends. So we know that Boaz was not there by accident. And we know that Boaz is there as a direct answer to Naomi's prayer in Romans, or Romans Ruth chapter 1. Even Naomi knows it, even though she doesn't quite realize it. You know, at the end of this day, when, when Ruth comes home to Naomi and she's holding like 30 pounds of, of threshed barley, so think if you've got a dog, like the big pack of dog food, right? And she was supposed to have enough to like make a loaf of bread. And she comes home with enough food that they can trade with it, they can get other food, they can eat for weeks. And she shows up that day at home and Naomi goes, where were you? And she says, oh, this random dude named Boaz, chance, chance, just ended up there. Did you catch what Naomi said? Naomi said he has not stopped showing his kindness, his chesed to the living and the dead. I'm pretty sure Naomi meant Boaz. He hasn't stopped showing this loyal love, this costly, sacrificial love, because she couldn't see God's fingerprints yet. But the truth is, God was showing his faithful, loyal love through Boaz. And we're going to talk in the weeks to come, because Boaz is about to become really important in the next couple chapters, about how he points us to the goodness and the grace and the sacrificial love of our God. But right now, you can just look at chapter 2. And we see as you look at it that Boaz is used to show God's faithfulness to Ruth and Naomi. And the first way is protection. When Boaz arrives in the field, he asks his foreman, whose lady is that? Right? Whose, whose is that woman? And he's not being uh, mean or irreverent or sexist. He was asking a question that makes sense in his culture. In his culture, a woman needed to have a man who she was, all right, to whom she was, a husband, a father. He's really asking, who is responsible to protect that woman? She's working here in my fields. Who's responsible? Who's going to make sure she's safe? And the foreman can't even get her name out. He says, that's the Moabite woman from Moab. She's with Naomi. It's like he wants to make it as clear as possible. There is nobody protecting that lady. And what's Boaz's response? He calls Naomi over and he says to her, don't leave my fields for the whole harvest season. From Passover to Pentecost, you stay in my field because I'm going to tell my men not to harm you. You're not going to be harmed physically, sexually, verbally. Nobody's going to bother you because you just came under my protection. Matter of fact, later on, we hear him actually go to his employees and say, touch her and you're going to get it, right? Ruth's response, when this man, this man of great power, this man of great authority, this man of great standing, this man who should not have batted an eye at her twice, when he issues his protection over her, her response is to fall on her knees, forehead touches the ground, bows in front of him, and the only thing she can say is, why would you notice the unnoticed? Why, why do you pay any attention to the likes of me? Because she's experiencing in that moment this incredible glimpse of God's faithfulness, that he would protect those who've done nothing to deserve it. Now you can keep moving. After that, uh, Boaz gives Ni or Ruth, excuse me, not only protection, but, but a place. Lunchtime comes around, and, and, and we are told that when it comes, uh, uh, verse 14, at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here 
have some bread, and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain, and she ate all she wanted and even had some left over. And don't miss that. Not only does Boaz issue protection, but he gives her a place, friends. The, the way the sentence is written in Hebrew, and he says, come over, it, it doesn't sound like he said, hey, the employee lunchroom is over there, and I eat in my office. It sounds more like what he said was, come here. You get a place, probably a place of honor, a place right next to him. You get a place at my table, and then he serves her. Right? He provides her with her lunch, because this woman came with nothing and has nothing. He feeds from his own abundance. The master serves the person who's a nobody. And for the first time in probably a very long time, she ate until she was full. So much so she had leftovers to take home. I wonder what all the other employees thought when the Moabite woman from Moab is not only getting protection, but is given a place. And he doesn't stop there. His faithfulness, Boaz, uh, him showing that chesed love of God, he gives her provision, doesn't he? You know, the reason that she came home with more than just uh, enough to make a little loaf of bread for dinner, that she came home with that 30-pound sack of barley, is because Boaz goes to his employees and says, drop a lot. Instead of keeping it for me, instead of harvesting everything and collecting all that you can, intentionally throw stuff on the floor. Throw it on the ground so that she can have as much as she can possibly gather. You know, if Ruth went home at the end of the day thinking pretty good of herself, thinking, man, I am super industrious, I am the best harvester there is, little does she know that the only reason she went home with everything she did wasn't because she's a real hard worker and a lovely, smart woman. It's because Boaz gave it to her. All of this, friends, that's God's faithfulness. Now, chapter 2 still ends. So Ruth stayed close to the servant girls of Boaz to glean until the barley and the wheat harvest were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Now, why on earth would he tell us that? We know. I think the author points that out because he wants you to see. They prayed the prayer. They've waited and there's still no hair. She still lives just with her mother-in-law. There's still no rest in the home of a husband. The emptiness is still being filled, but it hasn't been filled. And yet in the middle of it, God's fingerprints are all over her story. God's faithfulness shown. In the coming weeks, we're going to talk more and more about Boaz, about how he shows us how it is that our God entered into our emptiness and he fills it. Today, I just want you to know, if you haven't already guessed, we've got a better Boaz, one far better. His name is Jesus Christ. And we're going to talk in weeks to come about how he shows chesed love. Right, how he was willing to pay the cost, to bear the covenant, to give us loyal, steadfast love, no matter how many times we have broken it. But today I just want you to think about this. Because sometimes when I pray the prayers and I open my eyes and it's still empty, one, I really struggle to see God's fingerprints in those moments. And that's when I have to look back and say, your fingers have been on everything. You have touched everything. There is nothing that has happened in my life that you weren't uh, fully in control of, so I know you are now. But I also have to fix my eyes on Jesus and know he really is faithful. For Ruth, that faithfulness was shown when Boaz protected her. Well, friends, it is for you and for me. You know that, right? When we talk about Jesus, we talk about one, uh, Scripture describes him as the, as the one who, it uh, says in Hebrews, lives to intercede for you and me. That Jesus Christ, this day before the throne of God, lives, as in it's what he delights in, 
to intercede, to pray for you and me. Boaz went to a couple of his employees and said, don't touch her, don't hurt her because she's mine. Jesus stands in the face of Satan and says, you don't get them, they're mine. He looks in the face of death and says, you don't win this one, that one's mine. In everything that you and I face, we have the Savior who looks at us and says, because you belong to me, I protect you. Now, don't get me wrong, there are times when I really struggle to see that. When I pray, and my prayer about the emptiness is, I would like you to protect me from fill-in-the-blank thing that's here and happening. And it's in moments like that when, I don't know, i got to go to the book of Job. You remember how Job goes, right? Uh, Satan comes before God and says, I want Job. And God's response is, yeah, well, he belongs to me. So here's what you are permitted to do to him, and no more. There are so many things in my life that my God has put his hands of protection around me. And when Satan comes and says, all right, Jesus, I want to get Kelly in this way, that my Savior looks back at him and says, yeah, well, she's mine, so no. And the only things that he allows to happen in my life are things that the Lord himself has said yes to. Friends, that means that the protection that he gives me is beyond what I can ever imagine and the only things he lets in this life are only for my good. Someday I'm going to get to glory, I'm going to get to heaven because I am going to get to the place in that moment in time when death is going to come and say, she's mine, and Jesus is going to say, aren't you cute? She belongs to me. And when I look back, Jesus is going to say, you didn't know how many things I didn't allow in your life. When you and I are in that place of emptiness and we're crying out and we're saying, God, protect me from, I think our response should look more like Ruth's, where we fall on our face in front of him and say, despite what is coming in this moment, who am I that you have noticed me in all these ways that you protect? Rather than when we raise our fist at him and say, why aren't you doing more? Friends, you see God's faithfulness in Jesus, not just through protection, but the fact that you have a place. In a few minutes, we're going to come to this table. The reason we come to this table is because it is a physical, visible, tangible reminder that we got a place. That God doesn't look at you and me and say, all right, uh, you can serve me, but, but you sit down there. That we have a Savior who says, no, come. Come to my table. And he feeds us from his own body and his own blood in order that we, in every bit of our emptiness, might be completely filled. You get a place at this table. And even more than that, you have this incredible promise in Jesus for provision. You know, I would be the person who, at the, if I were in Ruth's situation, would have gone to Naomi with my big old bag of barley and say, look what I did! I am so industrious! And miss the fact that Boaz had gone in front of me and said, "Mm mm-hmm, okay, I give you everything. You just pick it up. Friend, every single thing you and I have, uh, every bit of your intelligence, uh, every stitch of clothing, uh, every uh, gift you've done, every job you've ever worked, uh, everything you have is because God in his infinite power has said, here, I'll leave it for you to pick up. You and I don't have anything that hasn't been provided for us, to us, by Jesus Christ. That's his love. And today, if you find yourself in the waiting, you prayed the prayer, you ate the green beans, and it's still empty, this is where peace comes. There's peace in the waiting of being able to say in this moment, God, I know there's nothing that happens by chance. Your fingerprints are on everything. And there's peace that comes by being able to say, God, I see your faithfulness because those things never change. You are infinitely protected by your Savior. You have a place at his table. And his provision gives you everything that you have and need this day all the way through eternity. Now, as the band's coming forward, we're going to prepare 
I'm going to prepare to pray. And throughout the season of Advent, we're going to be continuing to put up, um, to put up a prayer. You can come before our God in the next couple of moments and you can pray these words. You can let this lead you into the presence of the one who wants you to know in the waiting that you can trust his fingerprints and his faithfulness. But this morning, you can also just come before the Lord. Listen, if you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, then you don't get to see the evidence of his fingerprints and you cannot receive his faithfulness. If you don't know Jesus, today's the day to say yes. But if you do know him, I invite you in the waiting to come before him and confess who he is as we invite him to give us rest while we wait. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Jesus, we thank you for chesed love, for a love that is is perfect. I thank you that you're the God that keeps the covenant no matter what it costs you. And that even as we wait, we wait for you to fill the emptiness today in this life. We wait for you to fill the emptiness perfectly in totality when we reach glory. God, would you give us the eyes to see that your fingerprints are on everything. We can trust that you are working even as we wait. And then Jesus, as we fix our eyes on you, may we know with absolute certainty, no matter what we're walking through, how empty it may feel, you are still faithful. God, thank you for protection and a place and provision. May we be a people who more and more are filled with the peace that comes from those truths. Jesus, we pray these things in your name. And all God's people said.